Will you explain your new podium? Oh, absolutely. So, to start with the beginning, I was in North Africa um, with my daughter and my wife, and uh, I was running in the souk in Marrakesh, and my daughter was saying, why are you running so fast? And I was like very anxious, and I was like, I'm looking for the forehead of Nietzsche. <laughs> and my daughter's like, what? What? Like she said, said yes, I, I don't, you, you'll understand someday I'm looking for the forehead of Nietzsche. So I, I was walking nervously in the souk, and I was like, and suddenly I find this, this huge key. I knew it was in the souk somewhere. And so I, I bought it, um, and, and then I built this structure and a system to open the forehead of Nietzsche from which I can extract the, the lecture directly from his brain. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a surgi surgical tool that I had for years. And you know, you put something in the back of your studio and 10 years later you say, oh, I understand why I bought this, but it's not immediate like you see it. It's like, oh, that's for Nietzsche's brain, you know? So <laughs> this is in case because the first cranium uh, uh, part here, uh, it's very extended, uh, like the Peruvian sacred uh, 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 craniums. And uh, I happened that the lecture stuck in there. So I needed this extension. This is not just uh, uh, for aesthetic, it's also for practical reason. And there, here you go. <laughs> See if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Fresh lecture from the brain of Nietzsche himself. By the way, I mean, I, I don't want to steal too much, but I, I, I love to create new things. So I figure out that if I drill a hole here, I can put a cigar and with a tube, I can smoke from it. <laughs> and having puffed up, and then after I focus on the lecture, and if the cigar is off, I can say in the audience, do you mind lighting the cigar of Nietzsche? He needs uh, <laughs> one more. So, but that's for the future. My dear fellow Victorians, me and my sideburns are delighted to welcome you to the philosophy lecture. If lithium is a primordial element that appeared in high density during the Big Bang, that would explain my first impression when I arrived in Bombay Beach with the portal three years ago. I had an overwhelming feeling of primordiality. I remember saying to Tao, I did not know that ancient Egypt was in California. Do you, do you remember that? <laughs> I forgot and, that. And he said, exactly. <laughs> that was really what I was feeling. My sensation was very clear, and I had it only in Bombay and in Egypt. When I arrive here, I don't really think about Sinatra and water skiing resorts. What I see is Abu Simbel, Luxor, and Aswan, the last city of the Nile. I think of broken gods, block of granite with mysterious inscriptions and buried scroll waiting in the sand for a more enigmatic civilization. The valley of lithium might very well be the second valley of the primordial. One of the most original thought I have heard about Heidegger is by the French anthropologist René Girard, who describes Heidegger as an ethnologist because of his quest for what is primordial and originary. Last year, at the Midnight Philosophy Lecture, Dr. Ian Thompson gave an illuminating lecture um, on the portal, which ended with these word, words, quote, nothingness should not be seen as an end, but as a foundation. After this word, the question that comes immediately to my mind is, if nothing, nothingness must be seen not as an end but as a foundation, then what is nothingness the foundation of it? Of? Heidegger criticized Nietzsche on the question of nothingness. 
Heidegger recognized that Nietzsche understood nihilism as a historical event in the Western world, but Heidegger thought that Nietzsche knew nothing about the nature of nothingness. You see, Nietzsche, you and I have something in common. You have the fattest mustache of the 19th century, and I have the fattest sideburns of the 21st century. <laughs> but you cannot call yourself the most accomplished nihilist of the age if you do not see the word nihil nothingness in nihilism. There is no knowledge of, no of nihilism without experiencing nothingness. But how do we experience nothingness? Heidegger teaches us that nothingness is revealed through anxiety. Heidegger gives us almost a revelatory dimension to anxiety, so much so that he posits that we should become the lieutenants of nothingness. That's his, his words, lieutenants of nothing. It reminds me of the words of the French poet Paul Valéry, who was a teacher at the Collège de France, the highest institution in France, in which there is only one position per field and per generation. This is the place where Bergson and Merleau-Ponty used to lecture. When someone would ask Paul Valéry, what is your profession? Paul Valéry would not respond, I am a teacher at the Collège de France. He would say, my profession is anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Heidegger calls anxiety an openness, a fundamental mode of being in the world. He calls nothingness the ground without which existence cannot be approached and remain close to us. Without the revelation of nothingness, there is no selfhood, no freedom, no daringness, and no openness. Nothing is more strange and enigmatic than nothingness, because nothingness is not an object or being, but is a phenomenon that seems to open a mystery in existence. But when Heidegger uses the word lieutenant of nothingness, it seems to me that there is something more that dwells in nothingness. Maybe a form of sacred that is not theological, but ontological. Or to be more precise, a sacred that is meontological, word coined by French philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy in 1973, that means the ontology of non-being. The philosophers that has the most to say about nothingness was Jacob Bohem in the 16th century. At that time, philosophers often confused conscience and nature. In other words, they believed that what was happening inside themselves was happening outside. But if you exist ex existentialize the words of Jacob Bohem, and if you understand the first cause not as the cause of the world, but as the cause of the religious sensation, then you discover in Bohem's philosophy the most achieved phenomenology of nothingness ever written. If nothingness knew nothing, uh, my apologies, if Nietzsche knew nothing about nothingness, and if Heidegger knew something about nothingness, Jacob Bohem knew almost everything about nothingness. I say almost, because he knew as much as his century allowed him to know. Jacob Bohem was just a shoemaker and a philosopher that Hegel called the founder of German philosophy, considering that all, all philosophers are German. I mean, that's a, the big thing to say, that somebody <laughs> is a founder of German philosophy. It's like saying he's the founder of philosophy, basically, or Greek. And Schilling called him a miracle. In the 1600, Jacob Bohem experienced an illumination that lasted 15 minutes, in which the mystery of the world opened to him. From there, he claimed to have seen the true symbol of the divine. We celebrate in 2024 the anniversary of his death in 1624, 400 years ago. I didn't know that when I built a totem. Uh, that's why I put the 1624 and 2024. What is profoundly original in Bohem's theogony is that God is not the primordial. It is nothingness that is the primordial. In his divine hierarchy, it is nothingness that is the cause of God. Therefore, God is an effect and not a cause. Imagine saying that to medieval philosophers. God is temporal and chronological, as it is the one, the ungun, the eternal nothingness that gives birth to God. 
As God is secondary in the theology of Jacob Bohem, you witness in his writing how a God is made. We are at the opposite of St. Thomas of Aquinas, for whom God generates himself. For the prophets of Gaulitz, the divine is not an effectus dei, but, a, but an effectus nihilis. Not an effect of God, but an effect of nothingness. In German mysticism's trinity, God is the Son, not the Father. The Father is nothingness, which is the first metaphysical gear in the motto of the creation of a God. And this primordial gear, Jacob Bohem calls it anxiety. You see the parallel with Heidegger, is very strong here. God is not the great unmoved mover of the divine like the Aristotelian God of Aquinas. On the contrary, the great motor of the divine is anxiety. Bohem breaks totally with the classical causality of Western theology. What we have here is an ontology of non-being that we earlier called me ontology that comes from the Greek me, which means non, and onto, which means being. Me ontology is the science of non-being or the science of the being of non-being. If the first cause is not being but nothingness, then non-being is at the top of that procession that produces God and the finite. If non-being produces being, me ontology is the science that wonders about the nature of nothingness. If nothingness has the power to give birth to a god, nothingness has probably an essence and a power that is higher than God itself. If nothingness is the first cause then manif that manifests itself through anxiety, we can speak of a theophany of anxiety in Jacob's poem's philosophy. Meontology is then what studies the na nature of the real first cause. By placing nothingness as first cause, we saw that Bohem revolutionizes Western Christian relation to causality, but he also reverses Eastern Christianity by putting upside down the hierarchy of the divine name of Pseudo Dionysus, who places non being at the bottom of the ladder of Eastern Christianity. When Jacob Bohem walks, all the foundation of religion, both East and West, seems to shake and totter. This strange theology is a philosophical earthquake. To say in the 16th century that nothingness created God could lead to excommunication or bonfire. To avoid the accusation of atheism, Bohem will use the distinction between deity and divinity, God and Godheit, from German medieval German mysticism. If nothingness produces God, we can easily end up with two gods, nothingness and God. So to avoid that problem, Meister Eckhart and Bohem, after him, are going to create a distinction between the deity which is eternal nothingness and the divinity, which is God. The problem is that when you read Bohem, he was not academically trained and he forget his own distinction <laughs> and calls divinity nothingness more than once. A session that in the 16th century had him have a few discussion with the Vatican and almost got him thrown in the, in the Iron Maiden. In Jacques and Bohem's philosophy, the creator is created and becomes a creature. The implication of that reversal is that it is nothingness that one must contemplate, not God. Because as posit the anonymous in the Liber Causis, an old Arabic treatise of the 9th century that speaks about the logic of causes, the power is in the first cause, not in the effect. So with this strange theology, we have a powerful nothingness and a powerless God. He reverses the process of contemplation as when we contemplate God, we contemplate a secondary cause. The corollary is that the contemplation of God has no effect. In his logic, it is nothingness that we must contemplate because in the logic of causes, the illumination depends on how close we are from the first cause. When Jacob Bohem describes nothingness, he used the metaphor of pregnancy. Nothingness is pregnant with God. Nothingness is primordial and God is derivative. Bohem will break the duality of nothingness and God to plainly affirm finally that nothingness is itself God. But how does nothingness become pregnant with God? Nothingness for Bohem is not an abstraction. Nothingness is not a being, but it has being. He biologizes God as much as he biologizes nothingness. For him, nothingness has a will. 
and vitality. Nothingness wants somethingness precisely because it is nothing. Therefore, the will becomes the nature of nothingness. But what does nothingness want? The other words for nothingness is force, vitalism, will, dynamism, actuality, and voluntarism. Nothingness is hungry. It has a stomach, a force that has a hunger for being. Therefore, nothingness wants somethingness. He wants even more. The nature of nothingness is to want beingness. The will of nothingness of wanting is so strong that it has the power to put the, in motion the divine life. It is what Bohem calls in German the Gottwerdung of the Ungrun, which means the becoming God of nothingness. This is the quadruple structure of nothingness. One, it precedes God. Two, it has will. Three, it gives birth to God. Four, is itself a God. From the philosophy of Jacques Bohem, we can say that nothingness is God in potentiality and God is nothingness in actuality. Hmm. Did any of you felt once dissatisfied with the God of your civilization and wanted to create another God? Well, if you want to create a God, it is very easy. You, have, you just have to go to Home Depot, <laughs> to AutoZone, and to Walmart. <laughs> At Home Depot, you buy a mirror. At AutoZone, you buy a metal gear. And at Walmart, you, at Walmart, you buy your human eye. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. I didn't know that was going to go well. <laughs> so we are going to see how this uh, trilogy of uh, uh, Home Depot, AutoZone, and Walmart works to create the Bohemian card. First, AutoZone. You need a gear to activate your God. There is no divine without a theological motor. You need to organize a procession of metallic gears that put in motion each other and activate the divine life. If you have the wrong first gear, the movement of revelation cannot start. Indeed, instead of creating a God, you will create inertia. So what is the name of the first gear? The first gear, Bohem calls it angst. It is the gear that you see up there on the totem of the first law of cause under uh, his date of, uh, of birth, of, de of death, sorry. We find back here the angst of Heidegger of section 40 of being and time. But Bohem, 400 years earlier, is going to go further with it. For Heidegger, angst opens a true relation to the world. And for Bohem, angst starts the entire mechanism of revelation. We can call the Bohemist angst the motor of revelation, the other first cause, if you may, the one we have lost or the one we never knew. The angst is called the first principle of the divine life, which will ignite the second principle, which is peace. According to Bohem, angst has the power to create a lightning, a flash, a blitz that start the divine. The fire of angst creates a lightning that ignites the light of peace. But how does nothingness create that lightning that ignites revelation? This is where we need Home Depot and Walmart. <laughs> nothingness produces the divine life by repulsion and by contrarium. But a, by repulsion. Nothingness, by having a will, develops a conscience in which it realizes itself as nothing. And this awareness of being nothing creates a repulsion in which Nothingness opposes itself to become being. This conscience is what Bohem calls the eye of nothingness, that you can also see on the totem in the bell jar over there. It's, it's a real, oh no, it's not a real eye. Uh, it's a prosthetic eye because I used to do facial reconstruction with uh, uh, Betty Bad Catley, who worked for the FBI and sold about 250 cases by re re rebuilding the people who, who disappear, their faces, and I, that's why I have a lot of prosthetic eyes in my studio. <laughs> <laughs> With this eye, it sees its own self in the mirror of consciousness, and repelled by itself wants to become somethingness or beingness, or B, you can also produce the divine life by contrarium, in which the opposite produce each other, in which darkness produces light and light produces inertia. The tension is so strong in the contrarium that it produces a lightning that ignites the divine life. 
The contrarium is what Bohem calls in German the Schrak, which is the dread created by the friction of the contraries. This friction creates lightning, whose fire ignites the light of the divine and frees the contraries of their duality. In other words, the fire of angst becomes the light of the divine. You see how much Hegel took from him, it's unbelievable. Uh, he recognized it at the end of the logic. The phenomenology of nothingness of Jacob Bohem is articulated in seven moments that I call the seven gears of revelation. One, the gear of anxiety is called bitterness, the torment, the turba, the trouble. Two, you have sweetness that is produced by anxiety's desire for its opposite. Three, the conflict between bitterness and sweetness. The opposition of the two gears creates a lightning, which is the fire of anxiety that ignites the light of peace. For this lightning is the passage from darkness to light. Very important passage. As Bohem uses darkness to ignite light, one must, after the principle, the second principle is activated, must deactualize darkness, not to remain in it. Six is the harmony of the sound. Seven is the essence of the body, which is the concrete actuality of the divine. The great lesson of Jacob Bohem is to posit that darkness is the active principle of the divine life. The corollary is that light does not have the power to ignite light. Light is passivity and inertia. There is no movement from light to light. Like Karl Barth used to posit, all theology should be a theology of crisis. So in the system of Bohem, when someone is saying, oh, I'm on, I'm on the side of light and against darkness, that person is actually saying, I'm on the side of the passive darkness that does not produce any light. The darkness of Bohem is radiating. Light has no causal power. Nothingness, by turning against God, expresses God in its first principle. Nothingness, by being the anti-God, creates a tension that produces God. It is the concept in German of God with a God, God against God, in which godlessness pours into godliness. In this moment, the anti-God gives birth to God. In this meontology, the abyss metamorphoses itself into God, and nothingness becomes sacred, as Bohem defined God as an act of, quote, I'm quoting Bohem here, God is an act of seeing and feeling nothingness. The repulsio and the contrarium creates an angst that produces the lightning that is going to ignite the divine life. The reception of the ignition of the divine life is symbolized in my totem by the chalice uh, there at the bottom of the totem. As the opposite produce each other, what can create a God is only an anti-God. 2024 is a great year to celebrate Jacob Bohem. <coughs> the philosophy of Bohem can only be actualized in our age only because only the age of anxiety that often is defined as our age can experience nothingness fully. And only in our times the gear of angst can be put in motion. So to the question, what nothingness is the foundation of? The answer is nothingness is the foundation of the activation of the sacred. As Heidegger posited in his famous 1929 lecture uh, called What is Metaphysics? He says, metaphysics refuses to speak about nothingness because it's not a thing. But there are phenomena that are things that define our relation to existence. Heidegger even created a verb for nothingness. He says, nothing, nothings. For Bohem, we could use that verb, but in a different way. The verb to nothing for Bohem uh, for him would be in the process of making the abyss transform into a god. <coughs> this abyss here must be understood as the feeling of nothingness. It seems to me that Jacob Bohem has found the last first cause of the religious phenomenon in the Western civilization. But this last cause is lost precisely because it does not flatter man's desire for metaphysical security. And maybe it is time for the West to leave ontotheology behind and begin its reaxialization of the sacred around a new concept that I coined here, <coughs> excuse me, which is the meontotheology, 
which is a theology of nothingness, which is, by the way, dear to Japanese nihilism uh, that Heidegger meets, meets uh, Nishitani a couple of times. It's in, uh, excuse me, I lost my line. There you go. Uh, so a new form of nihilism that is the actualization of the primordial. What is in the 21st century in relation to the sacred? The 21st century is the great battle of the gods. The gigantic teomaki is not the battle of an old god with a new god, but a war that God wages against himself to reveal a more ontological existential vision of the sacred. Dostoevsky once wrote, quote, it is God himself who dechristianized the West. It might be that if the feeling of nothingness is the first principle of the divine, and if the dehumanization of the world is the cause of the feeling of nothingness, then the regarding, the degarding <laughs> of the world might very well be the unthought cause of the regarding of the world. <laughs> That was for you, Mark. <laughs> uh, one of the only religious authenticity that remains in the West is to find courage to divinize godlessness. As we slowly realize, as the futurals, that what Heidegger called the lieutenants of nothingness are, in fact, the guardians of a very secular form of revelation, which is symbolized in my totem by the secular grail. Thank you. Wow.